you know, like you said, that there seems to be a lot of people who want to support homelessness. And actually, you know, instead of me talking to government and local authority and charities and social enterprises that seem risk averse, don't seem to really want to scale and really go for it and, you know, take things head on at speed, then actually, you know, I could change my approach and think, well, why don't I collaborate and partner with, you know, commercial organizations that are used to this and want to do this. So it's very, very rare that I meet somebody who is so passionate about the plight of the homeless. Richard has such an amazing idea, such an amazing plan and mission to really look at a sustainable project throughout the whole country. This is the United Kingdom that will significantly improve people's life. I'm talking about the ones that are homeless, of course. And is there anybody, whether it's government, whether it's corporate, whether it's social housing, is there anybody out there who is really going to support him with this project? You're going to have to listen to part two to find out. Staying Alive UK. Share your story. Welcome to part two of your interview, Richard, today on the Share Your Story podcast. Thank you for, for doing part two. I'm looking forward to hearing the continuing journey that you've been on because we've got a lot to talk about, actually. So where we left off, um, are you all right, by the way? Let me get am, you to answer. Am, yeah, yeah, you're okay. <laughs> I, didn't, <laughs> I didn't want to interrupt you. So. <laughs> no, that's fine. That's fine. I was nearly not allowing you to say anything there. So, <laughs> so thanks for coming back. I really appreciate it. And um, so where we left off was that you had gone uh, and jumped ship and you'd gone to this uh, social housing organization for like a pittance. Mm -hmm. um, and, but, but, in that, I mean, it was amazing because you saw an opportunity for your social entrepreneurship and your ideas and, and what you wanted to achieve and develop that with somebody who was like minded. So so get us back on track with that, uh, if you wouldn't mind, because people may have yeah. not. They may have been interrupted and they can't remember where we left off. So give them a kind of a signpost and then and go from there. Yeah, so yeah, I, I kind of decided to finish my contract with London College of Fashion, setting up a fashion training and manufacturing facility for them um, down in London on the basis that I, I'd been down in London doing that contract, trying to talk to to investors um, mm -hmm. to raise some social investment for for an initiative. Um, and I, I couldn't raise the level of capital that I needed, but the feedback was that if I could come up with something for around about half a million instead of a million that was more profitable and generated sort of higher returns for, for the investors, then the likelihood I was, I was going to kind of be successful. So I had that in the back of my mind. And at that same sort of point, um, the managing director of um, a social investment group that I, I work for as a social entrepreneur in residence kind of came to me and said, oh, I've set up my own charitable housing association. Like, I really want to set up a social enterprise. Come and come and kind of work with me. So kind of it, it was a point really where the contract was potentially coming to an end. Right. That the feedback I was getting from investors was, you know, you need to come up with something else before you do something of the size and the scale and capacity that you want investment for yes. to get more of a track record to prove that you, you know, cause the contract at London college of fashion was about 150,000. I was asking for a million and they were just like, it's too much. You need somewhere in the middle. And rather than carry on working for, for London College of Fashion, I, I thought, well, okay, I've kind of got investors in place here or I just need to come up with a new concept for half a million pounds. And obviously then, you know, somebody who I'd worked with before who said, you know, I've just set up a new organization. I want to work with you. Let's mm. create a social enterprise. Everything sort of seemed to come together. So I yes. left London. Uh, I moved back um, up to Birmingham and I, and I did kind of say to the Charitable Housing Association, I was like, I, I need a job. I need somewhere to kind of work. And, uh, and at the time, all they could offer me was, was sort of 20, 20 hours part time in a homeless hostel. So kind of going from earning £45,000 working in London to suddenly earning, you know, sort of minimum minimum wage or seven and a half grand a year. But for me, it was great because, you know, I could come back. It, it gave me enough income to 
to to cover my my costs and then it, it gave me the time to develop the social enterprise um in in partnership with them really and and kind of unbeknown to me really at that stage i wasn't really necessarily sure what the social enterprise was going to be but obviously mm. the experience of working in a homeless hostel and actually seeing how difficult it is for individuals to kind of move on from that situation yes. the reasons behind that you know quite often people kind of think like you know people are there because they kind of want to be or you know that they don't want to get employment or that they but actually it's a difficult circumstance to be in for anyone mm. really and, and especially if you're in that point where you know, maybe your mental health is is suffering, that you are quite isolated and vulnerable um, and alone. So I started to kind of design a number of concepts based around supporting individuals at risk of homelessness to kind of move on really from homeless hostels, you know, uh, and shelters, because I kind of recognized how difficult that potentially was, um, you know, for for a lot of the individuals there, and I, I developed about four or five different concepts, really. Yeah. Um, and um, the the one that kind of really resonated the most was creating move on accommodation for individuals at risk of homelessness, because there's about at the time, sort of five years ago, there's there's probably sadly. Um, a lot, lot more. I've not kind of researched and look, looked into the figures recently, but at the time there was 180,000 individuals at risk of homelessness in the in the UK, living in hostels and shelters. And government spends about two billion pounds a year to house them individuals. So to take someone off the street and put them into a homeless hostel costs eleven thousand pound in housing benefit. Wow. Then they have to be on job seekers allowance. They have to actively be looking for employment so there's about another four thousand pounds there and then mm. there's some ni contributions so to take a rough sleeper and just to put them in a homeless hostel which is just kind of in a room get them on their job seekers allowance so that they can claim the housing benefit ultimately i mean that's the reason why and then to obviously have ni contribution so if they need to go to the doctors or the dentists and kind of access to sort of mental health services and they're kind of registered and covered for all that it cost about sixteen thousand pounds a year so obviously kind of when i figured this out in my mind i was like i've just spent you know kind of that's 12 months you know for example down in london working for london college of fashion on a contract earning forty five thousand pounds and that was the first time i'd i'd actually earned a proper salary like yeah. what people would call normal or you know, or, or, or decent money, really. I I kind of scrape by here or there, kind of working part time, running my own projects, and I was kind of astounded, really, by obviously the number of stoppages that you had. So I was like earning forty five thousand pound, but my take home was actually like about thirty thousand pound a year. So I was like, wow, I'm getting fifteen thousand pound taken off me. Yes. And then suddenly I had the realization that was like, well, actually, I'm working really hard down in London, like 50, 60 hours a week, and then having £15,000 worth of stoppages. And then all that money is actually then doing is taking one homeless person off the street and sticking them in a room yeah. into a situation where actually they're finding it difficult to kind of move on, gain employment and, and live independently. Yeah. So I kind of felt that was like, unfair on on the homeless individual in some instances and respects um you know that they were kind of in a situation where it, it was like extremely difficult to to kind of move forward and then equally i felt that actually that's quite unfair on the taxpayer as well if you're mm. working 50 or 60 hours a week kind of providing for yourself and uh, and and obviously you know paying back into society and then you're thinking well actually me working full-time is just supporting another full person full-time to literally kind of just be in a room and yeah. not being able to move on with their life and kind of move forward so I kind of felt for the individual and the taxpayer kind of it wasn't necessarily the best deal so um yeah kind of because I'd been trying to set up another social enterprise getting hold of like unused um, commercial property but to create a platform that supports local young designers I was kind of wary that long term that's still what I wanted to do but that I needed to set up a new social enterprise so I had something around still wanting to get hold of and use derelict commercial property and redeveloping that for kind of social use because it would give me the track record it might be like a project for half a million but at least some of the other areas that investors would be like well 
you know, nobody's done a co-living and a co-working space before. We're not even sure what that is or what it would kind of work. And we yes. don't know that you can acquire and redevelop commercial property successfully and make this work. So I kind of amalgamated all of the concerns that I had from investors and kind of managed to align that with the situations and the issues of individuals at risk of homelessness. So I could set up a project that would obviously benefit them and create a, a model that could be kind of replicated, you know, locally, regionally, sort of nationally, um, but equally kind of tick the boxes that I needed ticking in order to get the experience to then be able to get larger amounts of investment to kind of what do what I wanted to do long term. And out of the four or five ideas, the, the, the idea that resonated uh, the best was to create move on accommodation for individuals that live in homeless hostels and shelters where I'd get hold of derelict on unused commercial property to create social housing on the upper floors. So units of accommodation in the form of like studios on the upper floors. Yes. And then on the ground floor, turn the commercial space into a social enterprise initiative where the individuals who are housed above can gain on-site access to training, education and work experience. So can, can I just interject there? Yeah. Had, had you seen that idea in working anywhere else had you ever come across it no like not necessarily not kind of necessarily sort of now knowing what i know like i have seen kind of other models or or that you i saw models like this commercially before yes. where obviously like you'd have a row of shops with flats above yes um or that you'd see social housing over there and then there'd be a retail based social enterprise kind of here but mm. i'd kind of obviously seen the model working kind of you know, commercially, but obviously they're separate identities. And then I'd seen social models where they have housing in one place and then training mm. and work experience in another. But actually from the experience of running social enterprises before, like retail-based ones, yes, I found it really difficult for those to make enough of a surplus to be able to kind of either cover a management fee for myself or really employ me full-time to work in the social enterprises. And, right. and for me, it kind of made logical sense that through running those i'd kind of began to realize hang on a minute kind of i'm i'm running a social enterprise here that's training you know individuals in homeless hostels and shelters to try and get retail based work experience so that they can go and get employment in fashion retail but i'm having to make 40 or 50 thousand pound a year from this vintage social enterprise to yes. kind of do that but then the other side of that then realizing that where those individuals are coming from, the organisations, the homeless hostels where I'm kind of get, getting these uh, these individuals from to help and support, then suddenly realising that they were making 10, 11, 12,000 pounds a year to house them. And me kind of thinking, well, actually, if I could house them and provide the training, I yes. can use the housing income to basically subsidise the training income so that the retail space is cost neutral. And then any profit or surplus that's generated from the ground floor suddenly can pay me a management fee or a salary to kind of live on, as well as create a surplus to reinvest and replicate mm. kind of the model. So I kind of seen glimpses here and there, maybe consciously or subconsciously, yes. but yeah. I had recognised that, Actually, I didn't realize that a lot of money is being made by housing individuals at risk of homelessness. But in effect, I felt like they were just being housed. And a lot of homeless yeah. hostels and shelters, like in Birmingham, for example, and other cities, really, they're down the main sort of um, arteria kind of road. So mm. in Birmingham, like the, the big roads that lead, lead, lead in kind of city centers yes. and things like that. So, like in Birmingham, the Chester Road, the Hagley Road, the Bristol Road, but you know these roads kind of have, uh, you know, once upon a time would have old Victorian hotels, and when people would come and sort of visit these yes, cities right. for business, they'd stay on these roads so that they could easily get into the city centre to do their kind of business. But but obviously, city centres have developed, and obviously you've got nice new hotels in 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 in, in the centre kind of come up. These old kind of Victorian in hotels and smaller outlining um, sort of buildings have kind of gone by the wayside. And what's kind of happened is 
that they're being used to house individuals at risk of homelessness, whether individuals or families. And if you kind of go down the Hagley Road, for example, in Birmingham, which kind of leads to five ways in the top of kind of Broad Street in the city centre, there's loads of old Victorian style looking hotels. Mm. And if you kind of look at them, they say no vacancies on the front. So you think, oh, they seem to be doing well. But then you'll notice there's no real cars parked on the front either. Oh, and right. what people don't actually realise is they're, they're just full of homeless individuals because wow. like the homeless hostels and shelters themselves quite often you know in the city centers are full and what they've had to do is these hotel owners that once upon a time would take business people that have seen that you know as travel large and people like that have, have you know and the holiday inn have set yes. up city center ones that are more you know you can get the train to the city center you're a couple minute walk then you're a five minute walk to your meeting of kind of not stayed in you know these they, they've kind of they've redefined their models by by seeing the opportunity to house individuals at risk of homelessness which in one respect is great because obviously at least accommodation is being like reused to for good purpose but then these hotels down there, Chester Road, Hagley Road, Bristol Road, they're literally, you know, an hour, an hour, 15 minute walk from the city centre. I mean, if you were in a car or going on, you know, a bus, but, you know, bus is four or five pound a day. If you're homeless, you can't necessarily nope. kind of afford that. So, you know, if you're an hour, an hour, quarters walk from, you know, the homeless drop in service, you know, uh, mm. mental health support, mm. the library the job center, colleges, universities, education. If you're an hour's walk away and you're very vulnerable, you're not going to make that journey, unfortunately. Um, and kind of what happens in a way is like it almost feels as if these homeless individuals are kind of kept out of sight and out of mind in that they're just hidden on these arterial roads that come in and out of the city in these old decaying you know, Victorian kind of hotels, and they're just kind of left there, really. Yes. Um, and they're in a situation where they don't have access to sort of support, to, to training, to education, or even have a community around them because, you know, the roads that they're based on are just kind of people are coming in and out. It's very sort of transient. And um, so I kind of felt that actually we needed more move on accommodation to move some of these 180,000 individuals on from, you know, these hotels, uh, you know, or homeless hostels. And, but recognizing at the time that there was a million people on the social housing register, there's now five, four, five years later, there's now 1.3 million sort of people, you know, on the social housing register. So, rec so recognizing that, well, actually, you know, Social housing in the form of like one bedroom flats, for example, you know, in the suburbs or city centres, they're not really being created on average because there's about a thousand housing associations in the UK and they only really build about 20,000 new homes collectively, social homes collectively, which only means each housing association on average builds 20 new homes a year. Well, if you've got 1.3 million people or a million people on the social housing register, and you're only building 20,000 new homes and you've got more people being born, more people coming into the UK. You can see from obviously me telling you that five, you know, four or five years ago, there was a million people on the social housing register. And now there's 1.3 million people that building 20,000 new social housing homes isn't kind of um, enough, really. And it's frustrating as well, because, I mean, government spends 20, it's about 27 billion pounds a year. And again, these statistics are a few years old now mm. on um, sort of housing benefit. Housing associations claim about 18 billion pounds of that and mm. private landlords that, you know, run HMOs or, for example, like these hotels that I'm talking about, they collect about nine billion pounds of that. In, in housing benefit, which if you kind of break that down, means that on average each of the thousand housing associations collect about 18 million pounds a year each. And in return for 18 million pounds worth of housing benefit, they, they, they only build 20 new homes, which if you break that down again, means that they only build a new social home for every eight or nine hundred thousand pounds that they collect mm. in housing benefit. Which, you know, if you're a commercial business, is if you're a commercial housing builder, you know, if you knew for every new home that you built, you could collect eight or nine hundred thousand pounds worth of revenue, you know, yes. you, you, 
you, you'd think you'd have the world's greatest kind of business model and you think that you'd have it kind of quite easy. So I kind of recognize that, you know, the issue was only going to get worse. And obviously I've been proven right in the last, like I said, three or four years, there's another 300,000 people in the social housing register. So I was kind of like, we need to build more social housing. And that's obviously not really being done by Chartmore housing associations and the sector or, or necessarily kind of all the commercial builders are focusing on building commercial property because they need to kind of, you know, sort of make money and they are building in kind of some respects, but, um, so, so the, I, I just wanted to update you on that figure when you said 180,000, yeah. like four or five years ago, that figure is now 320,000. Yeah. So by the way. So, yeah, I mean, you can see, what, 30% has been added to the total of people on the social housing register. Yes. And then, yeah, homelessness itself, people in hostels and shelters. So yes. that's actually like, what, doubled or Nearly. almost doubled. Yes. And again, if it was costing £2 billion a year four or five years ago, it's now going to be costing £4 billion. Yes. Which is crazy because actually – if you viewed it as a preventative kind of measure, the amount of capital that you could loan for four billion pounds a year mm. would be astronomical. You could probably build more than the 300,000 homes that you need. Mm. But obviously, we kind of live in a society in general in terms of government and local authority where instead of investing now to rent things in the future, it's very much like what's the here and now, like you know, instead of, for, you know, and they, they, they do it across the board, even with the NHS. So instead of putting in healthy ET programs within school, which means you reduce obesity later on in life, mm. they just basically direct with, directly work with obese people now and try and do that. But by the time they get to that stage, it's difficult to help and support them and it's expensive. And it's a lot cheaper to really actually socially invest 10 or 15 years kind of before that point. Mm. And actually homelessness is the end result of a number of circumstances. It's not like someone just becomes homeless. It's because actually they came, they didn't have a great education. They had a poor family background. They've come out of kind of care. They've, you know, and, and actually there's a lot of preventative things that government can do before the, all of these individuals get to a stage where they're costing the taxpayer kind of four billion pounds and, and that they themselves are in a situation that they can't really move on from and that there's no despair, which, you know, in a lot of instances isn't, isn't necessarily you know, their fault. So the concept really was to ultimately I wanted to create more social housing, mm. but I knew that the level of capital and investment, you know, if I was to get hold of unused, you know, I think I mentioned before, 3,000 unused office blocks in the UK, 30, 40,000 unused shops at the time. Um, you know, I subsequently found out that there's 15,000 unused pubs as well. You know, mm. then there's commercial you know, sort of industrial buildings that could obviously be redeveloped and, yes. and reutilised and things like that. But I knew in order to, like, get hold of and use office blocks and, and convert them into social housing, which is what's really kind of needed, was too much money and no one was going to back me for that. But I could see a real need for the move-on accommodation. But ultimately, you know, if you're going to move someone on from homeless hostels and shelters into a space where they can live and gain access to the support that they need within the heart of the community, that, you know, another 12, 18 months down the line, they're going to want to move on again into their own social one bedroom kind of, of as well. But I had to kind of take it by a step by step basis. So. The model that was developed, like, again, I looked around the streets. I knew there was lots of unused sort of shops, commercial properties. I kind of looked into redeveloping some of those and, and realised and recognised how difficult it is actually to get planning from government and local authority to redevelop some of these properties. But then I suddenly spotted pubs and I noticed how many unused empty pubs there were mm. and i did a quick google search and found out that there was fifteen thousand unused pubs in the uk and that 1100 close a year of the fifty thousand that are kind of up and running so mm. Mm. you know because again you know the high taxation from government and local authorities and business rates were and uh, these were actually community spaces once upon a time but then they were suddenly becoming derelict and unused and they already had the residential and commercial split and pubs they are based in the heart of the community it's sometimes people move away from these communities 
communities or like I said, the communities themselves have less expendable income, like we went through kind of recession and things like that. And so they have less money to spend on going out. And I was like, wow, actually, they've already got the commercial residential split. They're already known for being um, community resources. I just kind of we could just repurpose these to Mm -hmm. actually instead of housing landlords above and maybe kind of acting as sort of B&Bs that, again, traditionally like these old Victorian houses on the arterial sort of roads you know, we mm. use traveling sort of salesmen would come and stop, but obviously they kind of don't do anymore. We can actually redevelop these spaces, create studios on the upper floors. So homeless people can move out of homeless hostels and shelters and then redevelop the public house space on the ground floor to run, you know, for example, you know, it could be a social enterprise pub. It could be a, a social enterprise coffee shop. It could be a social enterprise vintage retail kind of store and kind of the, the models kind of, you know, really flexible and that actually it's affordable um, or more affordable than than the current situation that government faces, which is to pay, you know, £11,000 a year to house people in hostels and shelters um, because, you know, you can house them above the spaces at local housing authority rates. So in Birmingham, instead of paying £11,000 a year to be in a hostel and shelter, you know, you could house them at LHA rate, which is £98 a week. So immediately you move someone out of a homeless hostel and shelter a mile walk from the city centre, you move them into the city centre where they have access to the services that they need. And you save the taxpayer £6,000 a year in housing benefit because Mm. you're only claiming five and not 11. Mm. And then in addition to obviously housing them above, if they are still that vulnerable that they can't walk five or 10 minutes, you know, to the job centre, to the library, to universities and colleges for education or to other kind of people for work experience, then they can literally go downstairs within their own premise and gain access to training, work experience and employment support. So I kind of financially um, planned the model and um, I kind of recognised that, okay, I'm going to need to get hold of a pub. If I'm going to have to pay investors a 10% return, then I need a pub with about 10 to 12 units of accommodation on the upper floors Mm -hmm. and about two and a half thousand square foot on the ground floor that I can generate about 10 pounds a square kind of foot from. So about 25,000 pounds worth of income on the ground floor, 30,000, and then obviously 10 or 12 units on the upper floors, you know, that you you get in about 5,000 sort of pounds a year. So about 60 grand's worth of income there. So about 85 grand in in total. Total. And, and that's on the basis that obviously I was going to banks and trying to lend half a million at 5%, but because I didn't really have a track record and the capital to secure the loans, mm. if I could get a half a million pound mortgage at 5% over 25 years, that's about 35 grand a year repayment. So, you know, if you're turning over 85 grand, you'd probably be making about 70 grand net profit from that. Half of that would be a mortgage. And then you've got 35 grand to reinvest in to start to set up a new one. Mm. Take yourself 10 or 15 grand as a bit of a salary so you can work on the project full time and kind of cover your costs. But because that wasn't accessible to me at that stage, unfortunately, you just kind of had to kind of, you know, take private investment from investors. And if they're if you're taking half a million from someone and they expect 10 percent, then, you know, if you're making 70 grand's worth of profit, you know, unfortunately you, you've got to give them 50,000 pound of that. And then suddenly you only really have 20,000 to reinvest. So you can't necessarily pay yourself a salary to work on the project. So you have to kind of work full time or part time on something else while you slowly drag um, the project forward. Um, but um, managed to kind of get investors interested this time. Like I was really kind of focused this time round on on who I approached for right. investors. When I initially tried to raise investment, I kind of went to everyone. But I, I looked at pubs themselves and I thought, who invests in pubs, you know, and social housing? So I was like, well, it's either social housing investors, it's either breweries or pub companies. So um, I financially planned the concept. You know, I needed, like I said, 10 or 12 units, the two and a half thousand square foot. 
I kind of looked at it and I thought, okay, that probably rules out 90% of the unused pubs because 10 or 12 units is quite a lot. But there are old, old hotel pubs and things like that that, you know, you could get hold of for, you know, three or 400,000 pounds, spend 100, 150,000 pounds on sort of redeveloping. So around about the 150, uh, about the, the 500,000 kind of pound mark. Yes. And I just thought, do you know what? It's, it's worth the risk. Like, I think there's something here. So I, I, I business plan the concept. I was obviously working in partnership with the Charitable Housing Association. I was working in the homeless hostel and I was, I was kind of, you know, researching, like, you know, doing primary research, if you like, supporting homeless individuals, doing their one-to-ones, helping them trying to move on and seeing all the issues that they challenge and challenges that they faced kind of, unbeknown to them asking them questions about would it be easier if obviously you were in a city center location or or that you know if these services were closer or 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 what could somebody do like to make your situation better to help you move on forward and kind Mm -hmm. of all of the feedback that i was getting you know obviously helped to design you know the model really to influence the model to house people centrally in a heart of community where they can be seen where they can gain easy access to support services you know and and where they're in the vicinity of you know friends family and and kind of everything else not hidden away you know sort of miles away and equally for the taxpayer you know i felt that the model was a lot more affordable i mean if government rolled out the model uh, that I've kind of, and the platform that I've developed, you know, three or four years ago on the 180,000 individuals at risk of homelessness, the £2 billion, pounds, they'd save £1.2 billion pounds a year. Oh so God. 55% of the cost. And then in addition to that, you have the added value that the individuals who obviously live on the upper floors have the on-site access to education, employment and training. So within 12 months, you know, you're initially very upfront saving government £6,000 a year. So I have one pub now in, in Digbeth in Birmingham city centre as a pilot, as a model to prove the concept. So there's, there's 15 studios there. So that immediately says Birmingham city council, 90,000 pound in housing benefit a year. But on the ground floor is a social enterprise coffee shop where obviously people can get training, um, work experience and employment support, you know, and within 12 to 18 months, you're taking somebody who's costing, Sixteen thousand pound in benefits. Immediately, that drops to ten. You're then training them up, and then getting them into employment, into a job for Costa, you know, Starbucks, you know, Cafe Nero, for example, like the large chains or sort of coffee shops. Yes. You know, and even minimum wage nowadays, they're suddenly earning sixteen thousand pounds. So within twelve to eighteen months, you know, there's a swing of costing government. Sixteen thousand pounds a year in the taxpayer to then the individuals earning sixteen thousand pounds a year and paying tax and income, mm. uh, you know, and, and national insurance kind of on that as well. But whilst that whole process is going on, you know, you're rejuvenating community assets. You know, people have been coming into there and sort of using the social enterprise. You know, homeless people have been housing better. They have easy access to the support and the services that they need. Uh, and it immediately saves the taxpayer, you know, a, a, a lot of money and it generates the return that it needs to in order to kind of cover investment or repay mortgages and and, and, and things um, like that as well. And and it's, you know, like I said, it, it's 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 highly scalable. And, if you know, government adopted this model and saved this one point two million pounds, which was that at st- that stage. I mean, we now know it's it's four billion. So what, <laughs> you know, you, you're looking at. It could save government, you know, what, 2.2 billion now, you know, I mean, they're crazy numbers, aren't they? They're crazy numbers when... Just to put that into context, I mean, the whole of the welfare state, I think it's about 200 billion pounds a year that we spend. So actually, if we're talking about this model was implemented, it could save government 2 billion pounds. People might look at this 2 billion and think, well, you know, it sounds like a lot of money, but really it's 1% of government's total spend yeah. on the whole of the welfare, you know, mm-hmm. state. But this is what kind of social entrepreneurs can do and social enterprises can do. They they might not necessarily make a fortune, but, you know, if just within homelessness, somebody can create a model that can in effect save 1% of 
the whole welfare space then then you know what could a social entrepreneur if do if if government says to them why don't you take a look at the nhs or the prison service because the prison service costs us 11 billion pounds a year at the moment to have 105,000 people locked up in prisons mm. 100,000 which are men 5,000 which are females and then to have 180,000 people on probation so basically 300,000 people in this country within the prison system cost 11 billion pounds yeah 300,000 people who are at risk of homelessness in hostels and showers cost you know 4 billion pounds so you know there's 15 billion pounds there you know that's a very very sizable chunk of the it's welfare state you're, in, you're you're into like you know seven and a half ten percent but but actually like it's and and I wouldn't necessarily fault the individuals who were in those systems because how they're currently set up, it doesn't really help and support them to move on. And government's in a situation where it can't really create better systems because they're costing so much to run. Mm. But they need to support and back social entrepreneurs like myself who actually have models that can completely revolutionize that sector where we can actually get external investment. It's just that we need someone bigger and you know, supposedly better than us, you know, or who know more than us above us to just back us and allow us to leverage the capital mm. and roll out the models and things mm. that we kind of want. But that's not, you know, necessarily kind of happening at the moment. It's it's interesting. Um, I I put a, there was a little clip that appeared on Twitter yesterday by ITV News. Yeah, where they took uh, they went on the streets of Birmingham one night and filmed what was happening with the homeless and they interviewed some of them. Yeah. It's a really heart-hitting clip. Anyway, I grabbed the footage and I created a little video out of it, put it onto LinkedIn, and there's a hell of a lot. I forgot to tag you, actually, so I must tag you on that. Yeah. But there was a hell of a lot of activity and comments and people saying, oh, how can I help, you know, business people saying, "Yeah, how can I help, how can I volunteer, what can I do? There are so many people out there that are, there are. that want to do something, right? Um, and what just occurred to me as well. They can't really do anything because these people are hidden. I know. You know, they're hidden like away from sort of society and they're, they're put at the foreground. And there's a lot of people kind of, you know, in the city centres working and living who want to kind of help these individuals. But, you know, like I said, it, it's it's not only having a space in the heart of the community that the homeless individuals can gain access to the services that want to need. It's mm -hmm. then the community knowing that actually I want to help and support these people. Where can I go to to actually yes. and how can I do that? And if, you know, if you're if you're redeveloping a new used pub and, you know, and usually like some guy might go in for a beer, but instead of going in for a beer, you're going in and deliver a workshop for some homeless individuals. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, and actually you've got a space where you can just drop in. You've got homeless people living above. So it's like you just go in. You've got a nice space to work from. You've got people to help and support. It's a very easy, functionable kind of model. Whereas at the moment, you know, in Birmingham, for example, like there, there seems to almost be like more homeless organizations than necessarily kind of rough sleepers on the I streets. Know. I know. And because they are hidden, they're moved on. and And it's kind of... You know, it, it's crazy in that respects and instances, and there's a lot of people concerned. But like I said, the platform's not just better for the homeless people, it's better for the community to allow them to actually, you know, get involved and have an impact themselves. And I think the distinction here is, you know, where the hard strings get pulled and the press and media are great for doing it. You know, I applaud them for doing it and highlighting the problem, but they they're always focusing on the rough sleepers, right? Yeah. And they say, look, we got that's a That's the tip of the iceberg. It's the tip of the iceberg. And I appreciate that's what you need to get the mood change, you know, to highlight yeah. that. But we're talking about a figure of 300,000 people, you know, yeah. in the country being homeless in one way or another. And all of these people that are hidden in hostels. Uh, uh, yeah, I was, uh, and there's, there's hidden, because obviously, I mean, those 300,000, you, know, they're, they're, you know, they're on the streets. They are in these hostels. They are in these shelters. But in they're a, in tents. You know, they're it, in cars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and if you look beyond that, you know, like, you know, these are the figures that government sort of says, OK, these are the people that we're paying housing benefit for currently, you know, because mm. I assume this is where these the, the official figures come from, because no they know who they're paying yeah. benefit for. So, like you said, like, actually, it's probably not 
taking into account the people who are sleeping on other people's sofas, mm. you know, or in abandoned buildings or, you know, so the, the figure could be even higher, like half, a, you know, half a million or, mm. you know, I mean, if there's 1.3 million people on the social housing register, you know, and they're saying there's 300,000 people in, you know, who are homeless, there's there's a million people who are obviously hidden, like they're hidden homeless at the moment, know. you know, who know. who who are, you know, who are stopping with friends and family and, yeah. and have got nowhere to go. And what, yeah. What I, what I, what I loved in some of the things that you've been saying about having the space where they can train, you know, like you said, coffee shop, where they yeah. can become a barista and then take that skill and go and work for a coffee place somewhere else. And I saw, um, there's a coffee shop on Cornwall Row called Coffee 200 or something, 200 degrees. 200 degrees, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and they've got a downstairs, I think it is. Uh, when you, a training you, school, yeah, it's really cool. They've got a training yeah. school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I could just visualise that, you know, you'd have a training school for people where they could train how to make yeah. great coffee. and that You could run it commercially, so obviously customers could come in, but then equally, um, you know, the, you know, individuals at risk of homelessness could come in that's right um, yeah and, it could be and, a brand yeah. in its own right almost yeah. as well couldn't and two, it? 200, 200 degrees coffee as well they actually um, they started up in in nottingham and they've actually got their own roasters mm. in nottingham like i support a really rubbish football team called talkie united uh, <laughs> and and when we when we sort of played against Notts county i was up there and it's it, it 200 degrees roasting or roastery is right next to Notts County ground. And I noticed, so, I mean, there's huge like opportunities where obviously you can get hold of, you know, these unused public houses, for example, Mm. or or shops, you can create the units of move on accommodation on the upper floors. You can then create social enterprises on the ground floor, you know, and it could be, it could be a coffee shop. It could be a retail store. It could be a takeaway, but actually, you know, those models themselves are, you know, replicable. And again, like if it was a coffee shop and you rep and you had five or six of pubs and they were all branded the same, and then suddenly you could get a central roastery where you're yes. not only got people who, who are being trained to work at the front end of coffee shops, but then actually suddenly you need a back office with a head office to support you know, the functions of all those, you know, in the roastery, and online if- sales, and, and suddenly you can grow and develop like a whole massive, larger social enterprise. Yes. And kind of yes. this is what I'm trying to really do really by you know, getting also, hold of these unused properties, when- by actually freeing mm-hmm. up the spaces below, by mm-hmm. by pulling down the housing benefit from housing people above, the ground floors become cost neutral in effect. So then yeah. you can set up, social enterprise brands, companies, that they themselves can actually grow beyond the development themselves. Mm. But actually at the moment, it's very difficult to set up and run social enterprises because it, it costs you more to run because you're training and working with individuals from disadvantaged and social security backgrounds. And you make less because obviously, you know, the individuals who are selling the products and services are from disadvantaged and social security backgrounds. So, you know, if you were employing a recent graduate, you know, who's well educated, you know, who's got good work experience, you know, you know, by, you know, kind of by situation, they're going to be more commercially, they're going to generate you more kind of income. So, you know, what I'm trying to do really at the moment is level the playing field yes. for social enterprises to start up by actually creating the move on accommodation. And then beyond the move on accommodation itself, you then actually need to then get hold of the unused office blocks and then create the Holy Grail, which is these like one bedroom flats in the city yes. centres, which yes. I started to do after, you know, that project um, itself. I managed to raise sort of 1.5 million after raising the half a million to get hold of the initial um, sort of pub and redevelop that. I purchased a pub for £350,000 at auction, then spent £150,000, uh, I spent £100,000 on sort of redeveloping with, with the um, sort of investors and the charitable housing association. But, you know, like you said, there's, there's, there is a place for homeless hostels and shelters and that's for your rough sleepers. But 
I'd say from working in homeless hostels and shelters, 90% of the people in them, they're not that vulnerable. They can actually maintain a tenancy. They do want to move forward. It's just there's nowhere for them to move forward onto. And if you're going to tackle homelessness, we still need these homeless hostels and shelters, but we probably need to move 270,000 people out of them that don't need to currently be there. So you need the move on accommodation, so you move those on who do want to move on, but you move them on into spaces where you give them more support. It's more like touch. So instead of being 24 seven, someone drops in a few times a week, they maintain their tenancy. You make sure that they're accessing local services for, for health, mental health, that they're in training, doing work experience. And then when they get into employment, you then need to move them on there from their own one bedroom tenancies. So mm. a lot of them are too scared to go into private accommodation because once upon a time they were working, they lost their job, they were kicked out because most private landlords won't accept housing benefits. So a lot of people won't move on until they're actually in social housing because they know if they go back into work and then lose their job again, they're not going to be kicked out of their home. That, yeah. you know, that them paying their housing, their, their their rent on their, you know, social property, if they lose their job, will then be paid in housing benefit and they're suddenly not out on the street again. Mm. So, you know, moving on from getting hold of the unused commercial property and having the units above and the social enterprises below, you then need bigger developments like course, the unused yeah. office blocks. And I managed to raise 1.5 million and get a deal on a new use block, office block uh, in Digbeth High Street at the back right. of kind of Selfridges, where we were going to have 55 one bedroom apartments. It was a 30,000 square foot, 55 right. one bedroom apartments. And then there was about 10,000 square foot on in the basement and on the ground floor where I was going to have the social enterprise to support local young designers that I wanted to kind of create. Mm. Um, I, I sort of got all the partners on board, you know, had a, an offer for a 40 year lease, kind of had everything, all the planning, um, sort of application kind of ready, all the plans drawn, kind of ready to go in for planning and then started to approach kind of Birmingham city council, kind of the planning agency and obviously tax city center manager, um, councillors to try and get support because mm. I, 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 at this stage, I could actually see why, in some instances, so much little, um, so little, um, so little kind of. Sorry, someone's calling me at the moment. I don't okay. know how to stop them. <laughs> So I can hear beeping in my yeah. Uh, and oh I'm God, like, that's that. that. I know, yeah, like I was like end and accept or like hold and accept or I just wanted them to go away. But yeah, okay, sorry. It looks like they've gone now. So no problem. Um, I can at all. I, I can start to see why actually so little development happens in a way because um, basically, obviously, you know there was some planning put in for the pub, but it's just kind of the split from the residential to the commercial. So you pay your you know, your 350, 375 um, pounds. Um, ah, they for, need to get oh, you somehow. <laughs> I know, yeah. I know what it is. There's a, there's a delivery here for me. Who says that men can't monitor? Absolutely. Go for it. Okay. Hiya. Sorry. I was on the phone. That's brilliant. Oops. Cheers. Thank you. Ta, thanks. Bye. There you go. There's real life. Evidence it's real proof life. That men, the men can multitask. They can, they can deliver, a, <laughs> receive a package and podcast at the same, yes. <laughs> at, the, at the same time. We're definitely so, leaving uh, this bit in. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Um, so um, yeah, so you know, the planning for the pub only cost maybe seven hundred pounds. But then when suddenly I went to do planning on an unused office block. Yes. I then was told by kind of, you know, the planners that, oh, yeah, you want 55 one-bedroom apartments on five floors. Well, even though the five floors are exactly the same, it's £375 per unit times the 55 and then the 375 for the planning for the social enterprise on the downstairs. So to put in planning permission is going to basically cost you £25,000. Wow. So I was in a position where I was suddenly going to have to put up £25,000 to have a few people look at some plans for an hour and within an hour or two then potentially go, I'm really sorry we've not given you planning for that, but thanks for the £25,000. Yeah. 
Yeah. So um, the investors obviously didn't want to put up the £25,000 with the planning without some assurances, really, from councillors, from planners, um, from, you know, city centre manager that, oh, you know, if we're going to go for this development, um, which, you know, unfortunately, basically, in the end fell through because I couldn't get people from Birmingham City Council to kind of back the potential scheme enough for the investors to think it's worth us putting in, which is really sad because, like I said before, it's £11,000 a year for someone to be in a homeless hostel. Yes. And, 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 you know, say there's 50 rough there's, – there's no more than 50 rough sleepers in Birmingham City Centre, I don't think. I mean, official figures are a lot lower, but, mm. you know, say there's 50 – I was going to create a development in Birmingham City Centre that could basically house every rough sleeper in Birmingham CBD. It was it was going to be the only social housing in Birmingham, like City Centre in the wow. central business district. Mm. So 55 units, and bearing in mind that each one was going to save Birmingham City Council six thousand pounds a year mm. so that's three hundred and thirty thousand pounds a year in housing benefit the development was going to save that's over 13 million pounds over the 40-year lease oh and in God. addition to that was going to be this co-living co-working co-retailing space downstairs for local young designers that would also provide work experience and training to the individuals who are housed above mm. And, yeah, it was really kind of frustrating. But the really great thing for me was that, obviously, going back to when I was trying to raise a million pounds just to create this co-living, co-working, co-retailing space for local young designers, you know, people were telling me to go away and that they wouldn't, like, invest this level of, you know, sort of capital in me, that actually me going back and designing something for half a million pounds to then get the track record actually worked and actually I was able to raise more money than I thought. And suddenly I was at a level and a stage. So although there was loads of disappointment from this, I actually, what I took from it was that I finally managed to reach the stage where I, I have the track record and people have the belief in me as an individual that I can actually pull off and develop these, these schemes like Absolutely. this. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So, and kind of where I am now is that I'd love to do some more larger developments like this, but the experience of working with a charitable housing association, private investors, you know, it, in, in theory and in principle, that relationship can work really well. Mm. But I kind of found the relationship that I kind of had, it, it didn't work necessarily. It works really well socially, but kind of commercially. I, I still didn't, even though the development that was created with the 15 studios and the, the social enterprise coffee shop in the the the, on, uh, the sort of redeveloped public house in, in Digbeth, although mm. it, it worked really well commercially and socially, you know, as a whole, obviously it worked more socially and commercially better for the Charitable Housing Association and myself. And I still wasn't able to generate a bit of a, a salary and an income no. off of that development because obviously if you have to pay an investor 10 to 15 percent return on four hundred fifty thousand pounds there, there's not a lot left the other side but sure. um i kind of whilst i was doing this development um kind of it probably took me about um a year worth of planning and, and getting investors on board and then six months to try and find the right public house to acquire and redevelop. And once I was getting to that stage, I'd looked into four or five pubs and I wasn't quite sure, you know, whether we were going to be able to get something in Birmingham in the end. And all my investors and partners are in Birmingham. So I took a job as an enterprise manager at, right. uh, a, a, a university in the city centre Um to 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 because I kind of recognized that if I was going to replicate this model in the future, that I needed my own capital. So I took a role there you know, sort of 40, 45,000 again, like I was in London. And then suddenly I could save 10 or 15,000 pounds to kind of build up my own capital to kind of go to banks to kind Makes of lend sense. money. And I've kind of got the track record now. So the pub's been running for about three, um, you know, three, three and a half years now. So it's got a good solid track record. It's worked really well commercially and socially. I've been working for Birmingham City University as the enterprise manager for about, sort of three and a half years now and I've managed to save up 40, 50,000 pounds so that, um, you know, I can now 
uh, I now have lenders I've approached. I just sort of gone through the process of approaching 35 to 40 different social investors. And I have, I have lenders now that will, I have a lender who will actually lend me up to two and a half million for a development, Whoa. but <laughs> but the repay the repayments on two and a half million pound a year over twenty five years are one hundred and seventy five grand. So obviously, yes. unfortunately, I don't have the income and the revenue to cover that. So what I'm going to have to do is, but I, I have another lender that will lend me seventy five percent of end value. Mm-hmm. So the 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 development in Digbeth cost four hundred and fifty grand. It's now worth nine hundred and fifty grand. So wow. they'll retrospectively lend on 75% of the value, which on that development would have been 680 grand, but obviously it only costs 480, uh, 450 grand to do. So in effect, they they would give me 100% mortgage, but they they wouldn't give me 100% mortgage. They'd actually give me 75% of end value, but that would equate to 100% uh, mortgage. But I, I, I built up <laughs> capital anyway. To, and this is, this is why, like, as well, like, because – Banks won't, and social investors won't back and support young social entrepreneurs unless you have money to put down. But then if you have money and collateral to put down, then you wouldn't go to social investors. You just go to banks. Yeah. So, I mean, the fr- thing is, it's from, very frustrating. From but, just but, listening to you, uh, just to give you a chance to catch your breath a little bit with picking up packages and stuff, um, listening to, you know, this whole journey in terms of, you know, raising money, how much it could save the council, um, doing good in the community, training people, rehousing them, rehoming them, moving them on. You know, th- there is so much involved with that. If you, if somebody came along to me and said, Michael, do you fancy doing this? And I'd go, I have no idea what I'm doing, but look what's involved. And I, for whoever is listening to this podcast you know that that just listening to you and the knowledge that you have on the a the subject matter involved and the, the yeah. community that's affected mm-hmm. but also the whole financial modeling and and all the processes you need and to the go project through. and the process and the end goal and the drive and the you know enthusiasm for making this happen that that's that's what you, people are buying into. Forget about oh, I need to raise this much. I need to raise that. If somebody could just kind of bottle what you've got, you know, in yeah. terms of your kind of inspiration with this, this is what happens on drag. You need to get onto Dragon's <laughs> Den, I reckon. They can't. They can't lend enough money. Could they only lend <sighs> up to a quarter of a million? And I really. Uh, unfortunately, but a quarter of a million is a stars. Well, uh, unfortunately, like believe it or not, a quarter of a million, you know, probably wouldn't buy you, you know, no, you know, know, a pub. So, and, and know, you ha- like you have, you had like like when I first did the financially planning with the returns that you have to pay all the people, uh, you know, it's like always oh, they want a ten percent return. I have to work. 10 or 12 units and yes, you know yes. realistically you can only do that for about half a million so but i mean fortunately the position that i'm in now is because i have the track record yes um and i've built up my own capital i've now you know i've now got a lender who'll who'll lend me money when i want you know up to you know like i said five six hundred thousand pounds and what i'm going to have to do over the next few years is you know, in other parts of the country, acquire and redevelop other public houses. But instead of using investors' kind of money and paying ten percent, I can lend at five percent, have a repayable mortgage over twenty-five um, years, and I can slowly, obviously, pay that down. And and if I can get you know another three, four, five of these pubs up and running in the next five to to ten years. The, with the residual income from that, I can then start to access, like I said, I've, I've had offers of up to two and a half million pounds in capital. I can then start to generate 150, 200,000 pounds worth of residual kind of surplus and in income from another four or five public houses to then service the loans, to then get hold of the unused office blocks, to redevelop them, to create, you know, to not only have the studios with the social enterprises below as the move on yes. accommodation, but then to be able to provide the one bedroom flats in the city centres That's with even it. larger yeah. social enterprises on the ground floor yes. to have even larger impacts. Yes. Because, you know, at the moment, there's a lot of social entrepreneurs kind of like me and people in the community that want to do good, mm. but all the mechanisms at, 
you know, that are set up, they, they only really benefit, you know, commercial entities and commercial entities that can run at scale. And that's why, like, you know, every high street's basically the same. It's all big companies. And again, like, even like the high streets are all owned by pension companies, by insurers, by mm. banks, by mm. financiers, by high net worth individuals. Mm. And everything is geared up towards scale and large, big kind of business. Whereas actually social enterprise by and large is, is smaller scale. But in order to level the playing field, individuals like myself kind of are trying to create platforms where we can go and get hold of commercial property that nobody wants, like pubs, where we can then provide the much needed social housing and then spaces underneath for social enterprises to come in. And, you know, instead of charging them a rental, for example, I can literally say to a social enterprise with that model, knowing that I have enough money from the accommodation upstairs to cover the cost of the whole development, I can take a financial risk myself and, st and say, well, instead of taking a fixed £15,000, you know, rental income from this, that mm -hmm. I could then at least pay myself 300 quid a week, you know, from that as a bit of a salary. Actually, you know, I'm in this more to help people. So actually I can risk the space and I can work with and support a local, another local social entrepreneur or young entrepreneur or charity or social enterprise to set up an initiative and actually take a profit share in that and help them grow and develop that entity that maybe I could then replicate, you know, sort of, you know, that with them in other locations where I can put social housing above and kind of have a new approach to kind of capitalism in a way. Because I, I believe you, you can make money from helping people and supporting others. And I actually personally believe you can make more money helping and supporting others than you can through capitalism. It's just, it takes a lot more time, energy, and effort. And yes. unfortunately, capitalism is about short-term gains. And equally, government runs on this principle as well. Even that, you know, you get elected into government, you have, what, four to six years in. And, and you've you're, you're you're kind of judged on what you're doing in a short period of time but long-term systemic social issues and challenges can't be um made right or corrected with short-term solutions you need long-term kind of aims goals and objectives and I, you know i believe i can start to build kind of platforms to not only house people but equally to kind of put other social entrepreneurs and social ent enterprises on a footing where we can all work collaboratively to kind of, you know, fight commercial, you know, industry and larger industry and, and make, you know, make the world a kind of a better place than, than you know, kind of it, it, it is today. But we, we're not really going to do that as a, you know, as social entrepreneurs individually. We need to come together collectively. And some of my frustrations yeah, is, from... Yeah working with some you know like i said there's there's 180,000 registered charities in the uk there's 90,000 social enterprises there's a, there's a thousand um charitable housing associations you know like 10 million people are employed within the social sector like 7 million in the public sectors then about 3 million work in the charitable social sector so you know when you look at things you think well you know if there's one person employed to look after another five people you know, in the UK, why have we got these social issues and challenges? But at the moment, we seem to be like spending a lot of money on running social organisations and paying people to help other people when actually what other people need is not somebody, not they, what they don't need is to go into a single point of access and say to someone behind a desk or a screen, have you got somewhere I can live? And then say no. And then the person telling them no is being paid 30, you know, 30 mm -hmm. 35 thousand pounds a year and then in my mind i'm like well for 35 grand a year i can buy another pub for half a million pound and redevelop it and create 15 units of move on accommodation and another social enterprise and it's kind of we seem to like basically be kind of paying people to try and support other people or not being able to pay and support other people when actually we need to be using that money instead of 
creating all these organizations with all this infrastructure that cost a fortune to run mm. and actually just creating platforms that are very cost efficient and very cost effective, like the one I've created yes. where people can go and help themselves. Cause ultimately like, you know, at the moment, you know, there's enough excuses for homeless individuals why they can't move on. And what we actually need to do is create platforms where there's no excuses mm. and that, then, you know, those that can move on will and can make the most of their lives and those that need the extra help and support won't. And then they can be identified and they can receive the more intensive support that they actually kind of, you know, sort of need. And it's just frustrating because, I mean, you know, we give £8.2 billion a year to to charities. So if there's 180,000 registered charities, you know, in the UK, on average, it means we give about 300,000. Well, you know, if each charity on average employs 10 people, well, you know, by the time you've paid them a salary, there's not a lot left of that 300 grand and they've rented an office, Mm. you know? So again, it's like, who is that charitable or social organization really actually benefiting is it benefiting the 10 people who it's employing or is it benefiting the service users but if only 10 percent of its income is actually going to deliver its services then to me you know it's it's kind of we, we need to change this this model you know at the moment we seem to be going from a top down model whereas we need to be going from a you know a bottom top uh, and the models that i try and create I like that. And equally, like, I don't try and create new organizations. I create platforms where existing organizations can come together and work collaboratively yeah. and not compete. Because at the moment, we've created a charitable and social sector where charities and social enterprises are just fighting over government and local authority contracts and, and donations from the public. And the public's going, we're already giving you £8.2 billion a year. We can't give you any more. I mean, how much more money do you really want? And actually, how and where are you using that money? You know, and, and the same is happening in government and local authorities. So we, we kind of, you know, we need, it's institutionalized and we need to create new models and platforms that allow these individuals and organizations to work in a way that, like you said, creates a platform to actually allow people to help and support themselves because we've used the current model for, you know, the last thousand years, if you like. And, and as you've seen, as we've seen, you know, in the last five years, 300,000 more people are on the social housing register, you know, people in homeless and hostels and shelters have nearly doubled. So, you know, we, we need to completely change the whole system, right. From government to local authorities, to how charities, to how social enterprises kind of run. And, and within that, you know, we, we need to adopt more kind of commercial models, but we, we need to work, you know, collaboratively um, and not against one another. Um, yeah. So, Agreed. But, Agreed. Yeah. But, you know, unless you create the platform that allows people to do that, which is what I'm in effect trying to do, you can't really show people, you know, the solution because yeah. unfortunately, you know, if you're really entrepreneurial and creative like we are, like I know that, you know, we met over a conversation and you can immediately see my vision and what I'm trying to do. But nine out of 10 people, unfortunately, aren't like that. No. And so like I even had to create, you know, the, the initial public house model so I could take some other people, you know, from the council round and go, you know, I was talking to you three years ago about trying to do this. This is what I'm trying to do. And you bring them, oh, this is what you meant. And you're oh, like, no. what did you think I meant when I said I was going to get hold of a pub and house homeless people above and have a social enterprise down below and it will save you this and do it. And it's not until somebody can actually come in and smell and touch and it's feel. It's ridiculous. People have it, no imagination. <laughs> no, no. And these people with no imagination seem drawn to working for government and local oh, authority and maybe you know even within the charitable and social sort of sectors and i, I don't blame the individuals that work in these because like I, I told i said it's they're institutionalized and there's a lot of good people working in government mm. in local authority for charities and social enterprises but unfortunately they're working within a system that's institutionalized and you know, like I work within a university in the moment and, you know, even the universities are very institutionalized. And I feel like I'm doing really great work within the university to support students and graduates to start commercial 
and social enterprises. But I have these systems that I have to work in and around that I, I have to work twice as hard to get the type of outputs that I want. Mm. But, you know, if you're not as driven and as motivated as me, you know, and if, you know, if you had a family and other people that you had to give time to and look after and, you know, kind of all the rest of it, then obviously like you, you can only commit so much to that role. And that if, if, if every time you take, you know, two steps forward you, you're forced to take a step back i can see why people stop pushing and just give give in yeah and then yeah. and become part of that system yeah uh, you know and you, you can only fight it for so long but in order really to change all of this you have to bring the vision to fruition and you have to have the spaces for people to come in and say look this is what i'm actually trying to do can you now see the vision oh you can mm-hmm. great mm. can you support me but unfortunately for me it'll probably take me 15 years from the point of having you know this is how things should be done it'll probably take me 15 years to get to the point to be able to bring government local authority and other organizations in who will instantly get what it is that you're trying to do to then get the back and the support that you need to then, you know, in theory, run things at the scale that you want. But by the time that everybody else gets your vision, I won't need their help and support. Like I already have lenders who lend me the money. You know, I've already got collaborators and potential partners. And the really sad thing is quite often is like government and local authority, you know, funders you know trusts and found charitable trusts and foundations they will only back social enterprises and social entrepreneurs almost at a point where it's like you know you know you're the you're the leading or you're the winning horse in the last few legs of a race where they're they're only prepared to back certain winners and and actually you're like well i don't need the back backing and support now i i needed it at the starting line uh, and, and 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 that's really frustrating and, and and stuff but you know when i get to that point you know government local authority other people might come knocking but you know i'll probably be in a position where i'll be able to say I, well i don't actually need you no, now i'm really no. sorry but it's nice that you've recognized all my hard energy and effort and you know did you know that i've spent i spent five ten years trying to get your help and support but I don't need you now, you know, and there's no, there's no value that you can add like to, to kind of what's been done. I mean, mm. I am still in a position where, you know, government and local authority and other organization, you know, investors and funders could come to me and I can kind of use them. But, you know, I, you know, if that doesn't happen, fortunately, I have all the skills, experience and expertise that I kind of now need access to the capital um you know it's just i i need more time now um but in the next couple of months i'm going to start looking for another um public house in another area of the uk um and then replicate the model uh, and then obviously once i've got another one up and running like i said get another three or four going and then i can slowly start to look at bigger bigger developments and bigger properties as residual income comes in to cover the um the you know the repayments on new developments sure. because in the period of of a new development starting obviously if you acquire a property you you then need three to six months to to get planning you know and then you know six to nine months to redevelop it as well so you're into kind of 12 month period where you know if you're loaning a million pounds you still have to pay the seventy thousand pound a year repayment yeah. so yeah. you need you know smaller developments first coming in to then outright just cover the seventy thousand pound for example you know knowing that actually if i didn't if you know and and planning can be quite tricky and 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 redevelopment can be quite tricky so actually if it if it's dragged out into two years instead of 12 months you know you're not going to bankrupt yourself within the process so i'm having to take a slower approach now like you know i wanted to find national partners big investors you know, take hundreds of millions and just yeah. roll this model out really quick, like a commercial, you know, like like Costa Coffee would do. Yeah. You know, for example, you know, like Costa had three or four, you know, small, a small chain, you know, Whitbread bought, you know, Costa Coffee when it had three or four, would plow hundreds of millions, and then over five to 10 years, 
you know, they'd turn three or four, you know, stores into three or 4,000, Yeah. you know, and it's, I, you know, I really wanted to take that approach, but I just kind of recognize kind of, you know, social sector doesn't necessarily operate and work like that. So I'm, I'm just going to have to, unfortunately scale things down and, and push you know, things forward to then maybe, you know, in 10, 15 years, I'll be at a point where I can then really push things then. I, but, I'm not just sure it's going to take that long. By the way, your microphone's um, oh, sorry. going against your clothing. But um, I, I don't think it's going to take you that long, Richard, mm -hmm. um, because if another project, if you started another project on the basis that you're looking at it, how long is it going to take? 12, three, 12 months, three years? I don't yeah, know. about it would take me, yeah, to, to, to get, identify another property, acquire it and redevelop it. But yeah, it's about 12 months, okay. 12 months at the property. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, even if you said 18 months, you know, yeah. that, that is not a long time in, in mm -hmm. this world. You know, I mean, crisis have developed a 10 year plan to end homelessness, for example, you know? Yeah. Homelessness is on the increase. It isn't disappearing anytime fast. Doesn't matter how many press reports we get out saying we've got the most employed people in the country ever. Well, yeah, our population has grown as well. Are you taking that into account? You know, yeah. and how many of those people have decided they've become self employed and they're not earning enough money yeah. um, to feed themselves, for example? So I think what you know, a year, 18 months to get something off the ground, even if it takes two years, I think there's plenty of time for, for, for in that period of time for somebody to wake up and go, this needs to scale to yeah. a level that, you know, can really make some impact over the next 10 years Yeah, and then really get motoring, you know, and get some big people behind it. But and I think I, you, I, I, I kind of want to do that as well. Mm. You know, like I don't want three or four pubs housing, you know, 30 or 40 people. I want mm. three or 4,000 yes. housing 30 or 40,000 people. Yes. Yes. Uh, and, and I might find ways to do that. I mean, I've kind of been thinking at the moment of obviously, you know, sort of uh, approaching, you know, existing pub companies at the moment and kind of actually seeing, well, you know, like you said, there, there seems to be a lot of people who want to support homelessness. And actually, you know, instead of me talking to government and local authority and charities and social enterprises that seem risk averse, don't seem to really want to scale and really go for it and, mm. you know, take things head on at speed, then actually, you know, I could change my approach and think, well, why don't I collaborate and partner with, you know, commercial organizations that are used to this and want to do this? And, mm. you know, but obviously, you know, it, it needs to be done. You know, it needs to be done in, you know, in the right way, you know, yeah. so it, it benefits, yeah. you know, everybody socially, you know, and, and you know, sort of, fi you know, sort of financially. But we'll, we'll, we'll wait and see what happens. All right, man. You know. Yeah. I really, I mean, I know we will continue to be in touch on this topic. Yeah. And I will want to get this podcast in in front of as many people that I know uh, yeah. who might be able to make a difference. I, I think your journey sounds amazing. And, you know, I applaud you for the work that you're doing, for the vision that you have, for the passion that you have for this topic. And um, I look forward to seeing how it's all going to unfold over the next few years. Um, yeah, and, me too. And it, it really sounds amazing. Thank you so much for your time. And yeah, you're, you're so passionate about this topic and I, I love speaking to you about it. So thank you, Richard. Have a great rest of your day, week, whatever yeah. you're up to, weekend. And, weekend, yeah, you um, too. I know we'll meet each other again very soon. Take care. Yeah, take care, Michael. Cheers, man. Bye. Staying Alive UK. Share your story. 